when I was younger, I had the, the perfect childhood. I was a dancer. My God-given talent was dancing, and I was the star. I was the little girl that they put in front so the, all the little, little girls can watch me. Um, I was a soloist, and then I started dancing with a male partner, and we did all kinds of fun lifts, and we stole the show, honestly, we did. When I started to hit puberty, I started to gain weight. My dance teacher told my mother that I was too heavy to do the lifts anymore, and that completely destroyed me. So my self-esteem plummeted there. It was right around 14, my parents got divorced. And I thought I was okay then because I just wanted my mother to be happy. So I thought it was okay, but it wasn't okay. I was kind of feeling like I really didn't have a purpose. I started hanging around with boys who were older than me and they were drinking, so I was going to parties and drinking. One night I was at a party and I was raped and um, I was a virgin. So at that moment I lost everything. I mean, there was nothing special about that anymore. I no longer had any sense of self-worth. I put myself in a lot of dangerous situations and a lot of um, things that I regret. Seven years after I was raped, I remember praying to God, asking him to please erase my memories. I don't want to remember anything. All of those things that were bad consumed my thoughts, consumed my mind, so I would be okay and then a memory would come flushing back and I would just feel so ashamed. I would listen to music that would bring me right back to that point in time, almost like it was playing in the background during these moments. It kind of didn't teach you how to overcome those negative experiences or feelings, kind of just help you stay down in that pit of raw emotion and anger. I really appreciate Kristen being willing to share her story, and we'll get to hear more of her story in a few minutes. But as I listened to her story for the first time, I couldn't help but realize again how easily we can become defined and imprisoned by the experiences of our past how we can allow the things that people have said to us and done to us begin to trap us and define us and we become overcome with anxiety, perhaps even guilt and a sense of uh, self-doubt. And we're going to talk about that today. This is week number two in this series called How to Be Brave. It's good to have you with us today. And let me give a big welcome to those of you on the other side of the camera in Clark Summit, those of you in Wilkesbury as well. And during this series, we're talking about what it looks like to push past our fear and to push past those things that tend to hold us down and hold us back and keep us from living the way that God has called us to live. And as I said last week, um, courage is not just something we need for extraordinary situations, like when a boat is sinking or somebody needs to be rescued from a burning building. Courage is something that we need in the everyday experiences of our lives if we're going to live the way that God has called us to live. And some of you have come to church today, perhaps in need of courage. Maybe you simply need the courage to make what you know is the right decision, even though it's not going to be a popular decision. Maybe you just need the courage to have a conversation with somebody that you care about that you've been putting off for too long. Maybe you need the courage to live out your faith in high school or in college because you're a student, and you know that if you really live out your faith authentically, it may cost you some friendships. Maybe you need the courage to share your faith and the message of hope that's been entrusted to you with people in your life that are looking for answers. Maybe some of you come here today and you just need the courage to get up every day and to face the circumstances in your life that tend to overwhelm you. You see, we all need courage in the everyday experiences of our lives. But here's what I believe about courage. 
I believe that the battle for courage is won or lost in our minds. I believe that the depth of your courage will be determined by the nature of your thoughts. Because fear doesn't come so much from the, the challenges that we see in front of us. It comes more from the thoughts that tend to germinate inside of us. I believe the battle for fear, for courage, is won or lost in our thoughts, in our minds. There's a small town out in Oregon. It's called Echo, Oregon. It's a city of about 640 people. And a few years ago, they made an interesting discovery. The the town council decided that it was time to renovate the city hall in Echo, Oregon, uh, because the ceilings were sagging, and the plaster would crack even if they repaired it, and the windows no longer operated And so they decided to renovate the building, and when they went about assessing what had to be done, they ventured up into the attic. And up there in the attic, they discovered over 10,000 pounds of pigeon droppings. So much so that it was beginning to collapse the building. That's why the ceilings were sagging, and the plaster kept cracking, and the windows wouldn't open. It cost them more than $500,000 to remove the pigeon droppings and to repair the building. And here's my thought. My thought is this, we live in in a world that is constantly trying to deposit in our minds the equivalent of pigeon poop. (laughs) And we become weighed down by poisonous thoughts and we become overwhelmed with stress and anxiety because of our thoughts, because of what gets deposited between our ears. Uh, Let me give you just a simple sentence that I think sums up the intersection between our thoughts and our fears. I would say it this way, the fear we feel often comes from the lies that we believe. The fear that we feel so often comes from the lies that we believe. The lies that may sound something like this, God doesn't love you, he probably doesn't even exist. You'll never change, so why even try? You're not good enough, strong enough, smart enough. You can't handle this. Your life doesn't matter. It's too late for you. The lies that we tend to believe create the fear that we tend to feel. And you may hear those lies from our culture. You may hear them from people that you know. It may just be the internal dialogue, the voice of your own mind that keeps telling you those lies. And it's my own experience as I think back to times when I've struggled with anxiety. You know those times I remember waking up in the middle of the night at 2 a.m., my mind just racing. Those times even when I found myself in depression. And after the fact, looking back a little bit more objectively, I can say pretty much without exception that every time I found myself there because I believed something that wasn't true, the fear that we feel often comes from the lies that we believe. And today, as we think about this idea, I want to draw your attention to an example from the pages of Scripture of what happened when a group of people began to listen to the wrong voices. It's a story that's told in the book of Numbers, chapters 13 and 14. It's the fourth book of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. And you can open up in a Bible and turn there, bring it up on a Bible app, or just follow along on the screens. But before we jump in there, let me just give you a little bit of history so what I'm about to read in Numbers will make sense to you. As you may know from the history of the Jewish people, that the people of Israel lived in slavery in the land of Egypt for 400 years. But then they cried out to God, and in Exodus chapter 2, it says this, the Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out, and their cry, and, and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. And so God heard their prayer. And he answered their prayer, and he sent someone to rescue them. It was this guy here, uh, Moses, who looks a lot like Charlton Heston. And he's doing that football-like move thing. Anyway, so God calls Moses. And if you remember the story, God spoke to Moses in this incredible, in this miraculous way from a, a burning bush that was not consumed. And one of the things he said to Moses was this in Exodus chapter 3. He said, go, assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, appeared to me and said, I have watched over you and have seen what has been done to you in Egypt. And I have promised to bring you up out of your misery in Egypt into a land flowing with milk and honey. And so Moses goes back to Egypt. He confronts the king of Egypt, Pharaoh, and he says that, and he tells them he he needs to let the people of Israel go. Now, now Pharaoh was not crazy about the idea of just letting this free labor all just walk out. So he, he says, no, I'm not doing that. 
And so then God sends a series of plagues onto the land of Egypt, and eventually Pharaoh taps out, and he lets the people go. And so Moses leads them from Egypt through a wilderness, and eventually they arrive at a place called Kadesh, which is right on the edge of the promised land. So 400 years of slavery, and now they're almost home. We'll pick up the story there. Chapter 13, Numbers, verse 1, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. From each ancestral tribe, send one of its leader. And there were 12 tribes, so 12 leaders would be sent in. Now, there's one phrase here that's very, very important. I want to point this phrase out to you. He says, the land which I am giving to the Israelites. Not the land which I may give to the Israelites. Not the land which I hope to give to the Israelites. The land which I am giving to the Israelites. In other words, in the eyes of God, this was a done deal. This was his promise to his people. Now, they would have to go in. They would have to fight some battles. They would have to play their part. But in the end, God says, I am giving this land to you as your new home. So keep reading. Verse 3. So, that, so at the Lord's command, Moses sent them out, these 12 leaders, these 12 spies from the desert of Paran. All of them were leaders of the Israelites. Now, if you keep reading the next 10 verses, it gives a listing of the names of the 12 men who were chosen to go in and to scout out the land, to spy out the land. I'm not going to read all the names. I can't pronounce half of them. But the key phrase is this. All of them were leaders of the Israelites. They didn't just draw straws and send in all the guys that got the shortest straws. These were the leaders, the people that we would expect to have faith and courage and vision. And so Moses sends these guys in, sends them in on this recon mission. Pick up in verse 17. When Moses sent them to explore Canaan, he said, here's the plan. Go up through the Negev and on into the hill country. See what the land is like and whether the people who live there are strong or weak, few or many. What kind of land do they live in? Is it good or bad? What kind of towns do they live in? Are they unwalled or fortified? How is the soil? Is it fertile or poor? Are there trees on it or not? Do your best to bring back some of the fruit. Now, I want you to notice something very, very important here. These 12 leaders, these 12 spies, were not instructed to bring back an opinion. They were instructed to bring back a strategy. The question was not whether or not they would go in and live in the land. The question was only how, because God had already promised them the victory in this. Uh, think about it this way, just to try to help you understand it. Imagine an angel were to show up today in the office of Doug Peterson, who's the head coach for the Philadelphia Eagles. And the angel says to him, Doug, I have a message for you from heaven. And the message is this. Today, when you play against the Kansas City Chiefs, you're going to win. It's guaranteed. You're going to have to field a team. You're going to have to put forth a good strategy. Your guys are going to have to play hard. But if you're willing to do all that, you will win the game. It is guaranteed. Now, obviously, that's just an illustration. We all know that the Philadelphia Eagles have not received any divine help in the last couple of years. <laughs> but that's basically what was happening here. God was saying, listen, I am giving you this land. I am giving you this victory. But you have to play your part to secure this victory. And so the 12 leaders go in and they spend 40 days exploring the land. And while they're there, they see some absolutely amazing things. Look at verse 23. When they reach the valley of Eshkol, they cut off a branch bearing a single cluster of grapes. Listen to this. Two of them carried it on a pole between them. I mean, those are some serious grapes right there along with some pomegranates and figs. And so this land, this land it produced this incredible, incredible bounty that would feed them so well. So at the end of 40 days, they returned from exploring the land. They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. And it goes on to say this. There they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit, okay? So, so far, so good. I mean, there's got to be this palpable sense of excitement among the people. They, like, can't wait to get there. Unfortunately, that's not the end of the report. Look at verse 28. What's the first word? But. It's a big but. But the people who live there are powerful and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. 
The Amalekites live in the Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Cellulites, the most dreaded enemies of all. (laughs) Just seeing if you're paying attention. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country. And the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. As you hear those words, what emotion do you sense? Fear. Doubt. Insecurity. Lack of faith. Now, fortunately, like I said, there were 12 spies that went in, but not all 12 of them had the same opinion. There were two who did not agree with the majority opinion. Their names were Joshua and Caleb, and so Caleb speaks up. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses, because at this point there was some rumblings. And he said, we should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. Now, remember... They were never told to come back with an opinion. They were told to come back with a strategy. Their job was not to size up themselves. Their job was to size up the land that God was about to give to them. Now, as if that weren't bad enough, it, it, it gets worse because these, these leaders, quote unquote, these 10 spies, not only give their report and give their opinion, but then they begin to spread fear throughout the entire community of the people of Israel. Here's what it goes on to say. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. And so they give this uh, bad report, and they're undermining the morale of the people, and this spreads throughout the camp. And eventually, listen to how the people respond to what they've just heard from these 10 leaders. Chapter 14, verse 1. That night, all the people of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. Honestly, I think that is one of the most heartbreaking sentences in the entire Bible right there. Do you know why they wept aloud? Because all their lives, they had dreamed of living in a land flowing with milk and honey. Because all their lives, they had looked forward to freedom and prosperity in a place that God had prepared for them. All their lives, they had looked forward to building a new community of God's people. But now, their dreams had evaporated. It was completely gone because fear had taken over their hearts. They wept that night, but not only did they weep, eventually their weeping turns into complaining. It goes on to say this, all the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, if only we had died in Egypt or in this desert. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder, like absolute panic at this point, absolute worst case scenario. We're all going to die, and our families are going to be taken hostage. Then somebody has a brilliant idea. Listen to this. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And the, the idea picks up steam. Listen to this. And they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. It's amazing. When they were slaves in Egypt, they cried out to God for a leader to rescue them. Now they're crying out for a leader to take them back. Do you know why? Because back in Egypt, they didn't need courage. Courage. Back in Egypt, they didn't need faith. They didn't have to risk anything. They simply did what they were told because they were slaves. And so now that things get a little bit challenging, they're longing for the safety, the security, and the predictability of slavery. And they say, you know what, let's just go back. I mean, that is human nature, isn't it? I mean, I came across this phrase that describes human nature so well. It's from the poet Carl Sandburg. He says it this way. He says, there is an eagle in me that wants to soar, and there is a hippopotamus in me that wants to wallow in the mud. And see, I I believe that God wants his people to soar. But here's what happens when fear overtakes our hearts, when we listen to the wrong voices. We decide that it's good enough just to wallow in the mud for the rest of our lives and to miss out on God's vision for us. And so 
the good news in this whole story is that, as I said before, not all 12 spies had the same opinion. There were these two guys who had a vision for the future, who believed in God unequivocally, who, who had courage, Joshua and, and Caleb. And so here's what happens in verse 6. Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes, which was a sign of great grief and mourning in that culture. And they said to the entire Israelite assembly, the land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not be afraid of the people of the land because we will swallow them up. Their protection is gone. Here it is again, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. Now, it's, you know what's so interesting to me? All 12 spies saw exactly the same thing. Like all 12 of them saw the same cities, the same people, they saw the same land. It's not that Joshua and Caleb somehow took a different route and never saw any of the challenges. They saw the challenges. They saw the problems. They also saw something else. Beyond all of that, they saw the power and the promises and the love of God And they chose to focus on that. Did you catch how many times in that brief little speech the name of God came up? He will lead us into that land. He will give it to us. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. See, Joshua and Caleb said, yeah, the people are strong. Yeah, the cities are fortified. Yeah, it's going to be challenging. But that doesn't matter because God is with us and we are not alone. See, the difference between Joshua and Caleb and the other 10 spies, it was simply a difference in perspective. And see, perspective makes all the difference when it comes to fear. Fear is caused not so much by what we see, but why we, how we think about what we see, our perspective on what we see. And here's the thing, we can actually choose to shift our perspective if we want to. Let me give you some examples of how powerful perspective can be, okay? So on, on every campus, I want you to look at this and tell me what the word is here on the screen. Turn to somebody next to you, play along, tell them what word is on the screen. Go ahead, tell somebody, what word is that? All right, some of you may have looked at that and saw the word good. Or if you looked at the white, you saw the word evil. It's all a matter of perspective. Okay, let's try it again. Turn to somebody next to you and tell them what's in this picture. Go ahead, tell somebody next to you. What do you see in that picture? All right, some of you may have looked at that picture and you saw a young woman. Others of you may have looked at that picture and you saw an old man. It's all a matter of perspective. It's all how you look at it. Let me give you one more. Turn to somebody next to you. Tell them what that is. What do you see in that picture? All right. Some of you may have looked at this picture and seen a goose or a duck. Here's the, here's the bill out here. There's the eyes. Others of you may have looked at this picture and seen a rabbit. Those are the ears. Eye, mouth, over here. Now, I saw this the first time, and I'm like, I don't see a rabbit there. I actually had to ask somebody, Where, where's the, I don't see a rabbit. Where's the rabbit? Then I found the rabbit, and I couldn't see the duck anymore. You know, it's, it's fascinating. It's all a matter of perspective. And see, sometimes when you're filled with fear, you've simply got to shift your perspective and see what you've been missing and see what perhaps other people aren't seeing. Joshua and Caleb decided that they, in spite of the walled cities, in spite of the powerful armies, in spite of all of that, that they were going to shift their perspective and not just see all of that, but they were going to see past that and they were going to see the God who was with them, the God who was powerful, the God who loved them. And they said, we can do this. So Joshua and Caleb, they give this, they give this inspiring speech to the people. So what happens after they give this inspiring speech to the people? Do they all stand and give them applause, standing ovation? Do they say, oh, what were you thinking? You're, you're so right. Here's what happens, verse 10. But the whole assembly talked about stoning them. 
Now, I'll stop there in verse 10 with that story, and I'll summarize the rest of it. If you were to continue reading through the book of Numbers, you would see how the rest of the story of the people of Israel plays out because of their lack of faith. This entire generation of people that was present in that moment, they wandered in the wilderness for the next 40 years. They never saw the promised land. They spent the rest of their lives wondering what could have been. They spent the rest of their lives wondering how it might have felt to live in that place. So there were 12 spies that went in. Two of them came back and they spoke with words of courage. Ten of them came back and they spoke with words of fear. And it was the voices of the ten that drowned out the voice of God and instilled anxiety in the hearts of the people and changed the, the destiny of an entire nation. So here's what I want you to do in these last few minutes. I want you to think not about the spies in that story. I want you to think about the spies in your own mind. What are the voices that you're listening to? Because the fear that we feel often comes from the lies that we believe. What are the voices that you're listening to? And I want to talk about three different kinds of voices to make this very, very practical. I want to talk about the voices around us, the voices alongside us, and the voices behind us. Let me start with that first one, the voices around us. We live today in the digital information age. Most of us spend huge chunks of our waking hours connected to the voices of our culture. Every time you turn on a TV, every time you turn on a radio, every time you open up a laptop, every time you tap your phone, you're hearing the voices around us. And I believe that has an effect on us. And I believe in our culture, it's begun, I think, to consume us. Let me show you some statistics here. Um, Americans now consume 60 hours of electronic media per week. Between television, radio, the internet, online video, Hulu, Netflix, uh, video on mobile phone, uh, 60 hours a week. And by the way, these are the statistics from 2012. In 2016, it was up to 69 hours a week, and a much larger portion on our phones and a little bit less on television. So we're constantly walking around with the voices of our culture buzzing in our back pocket. I'm not sure that's a really good thing. I mean, we come to church for an hour a week and expect to be inspired for that hour, but we've got to lay that hour over 60 to 70 hours of media intake that hardwires our brain to think a certain way. It's no wonder we're stressed. It's no wonder we live with anxiety, and it's no wonder we're directionless and restless. I, I, I read a news story um, from this past year about a little boy in Louisiana, a seven-year-old boy. His name is Cohen, and he's fixated on garbage. He's been fascinated with trash ever since he's been a toddler. Um, he goes running out the door every Friday morning to meet the garbage guys and to watch them take away his trash. His mom was interviewed in this article, and, and here's what his mom said. Every time we drive somewhere, he points out the garbage trucks, and he'll look at the different garbage cans. He'll even go on YouTube and look at videos of garbage trucks. It's been garbage since he was two years old. And then this, you have no idea what it's like having a child who has a passion for trash. A child who has a passion for trash. I wonder if God ever feels that way about us. Because we have such a passion for so much of the clutter that just trashes up our minds and our lives to the point where we can no longer hear the voice of God. What are we going to do about that? My kids showed me something on my phone that I thought was really cool, so I want to show it to you. And I have an iPhone, so it may not work the same way if you have a different kind of phone, but I have an iPhone. I'll show you how it works on my iPhone. On my iPhone, there's a button on the side, and if you press that and hold that for a bit, then this next screen comes up, and what you do is you slide that, and here's what happens. Right there. You should try that sometime. Just turn it off. You turn off your TV, turn off your laptop, turn it all off, because I think every once in a while we just got to silence the voices around us so that we can hear the voice of our Father. We talk about a different category of voices. Let me talk about the voices alongside us. I'm talking about here relationships. Think about the people that you spend the most time with. Are they people who are building your faith, or are they people who are draining your faith? 
I think one of the clearest verses in the Bible about relationships is in Proverbs 13, verse 20. The one who walks with the wise will become wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. There's a promise and a warning here. If you spend your time with wise people, wisdom will rub off on you. If you hang out with foolish people, you're going to suffer because of their foolishness. And so let me ask you a question. Are you surrounding yourself with people who speak words of truth and hope into your life? Are you surrounding yourself with people who pray for you and encourage you and call you up to be the kind of person that you know you can be? Or have you surrounded yourself with people whose influence is keeping you from moving beyond just kind of a lukewarm, half-hearted Christianity? Somebody once said it this way, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. You know, you may be one friendship away from becoming the kind of parent you want to be. You may be one friendship away from having the marriage that you want to have. You may be one friendship away from breaking an addiction that's been a part of your family for generations. See, I believe the right voices, the right relationships in our lives can be that powerful. The voices alongside us. So we, we believe in this so strongly. We believe in having the right voices in our lives that we actually structure uh, a lot of things in the life of our church around this. And, and I want to encourage you to go on our website, go to this page, parkerhill.org slash groups, because we believe life is better connected. Uh, we believe it's really important to not just be anonymous in terms of being a part of this church, but finding a group of people who know you, who can encourage you, who can speak into your life, who can pray for you, who are moving in the same direction that you're moving on your journey. And if you go on this uh, landing page on our website, there are a number of different group options there. One of them is called Starting Point. So if you're brand new to your faith or just coming back to your faith after many years, if you're new to this church, I would jump into Starting Point. Uh, it meets for like eight weeks. It's pretty brief. Meets right on your campus on Sunday mornings. Great way to ask the hard questions that you have about the Bible and Christianity and also a way to begin building some relationships. Also, you're going to find on there a, a group for women. Meets on Tuesday nights. Incredible, incredible experience for women. There are groups also for men that meet on each campus. There's a group that you can join that will help you to manage your finances better. But in every single one of these, You'll get to get the right voices speaking into your life, not just in terms of content, but in terms of beginning to build those relationships that all of us need. So I've talked about the voices around us, the voices alongside us, but let me talk about one more category of voices, and those are the voices behind us, because some of you are still listening to the voices from your past. The voices that still echo in your mind, it might be the voice of a parent or the voice of a teacher or the voice of a coach, and you can still hear those voices decades later, those voices that told you that you're not pretty enough, that you're not smart enough, that you're not strong enough, those voices that called you a loser, a burden, a mistake, those voices that made you feel unlovable, unworthy, unattractive, and you still play those tapes over and over and those voices still affect you and they begin to define you. Let me tell you this, if you're a follower of Christ, if you're a follower of Christ, there's one voice that you need to hear above every other voice in your life and that is the voice of your Savior. And see, that, that's what this message all comes down to, really. If we want to live as courageous people without fear, if we want to live up to the calling that God has for us, we've got to turn down the volume of all the wrong voices in our lives. And we've got to turn up the volume of the right voices, especially the one voice that matters the most, and that is the voice of God. And so in these last few minutes as I end this message, I want to do just that. I want to let you hear the voice of truth. I want to let you hear the voice of God speaking to you through the scriptures. I'm just going to read seven passages of scripture. I'm going to read these without comment. And I just want you to hear them. And I want you to let this truth wash, wash over you. And I want you to hear the one voice that matters the most. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. If God is for us, who can be against us? God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. 
God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. The one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. Just before the message, you heard part of Kristen's story. And how the voices in her life had brought her to a point of deep anxiety and deep hopelessness. But obviously there's more to her story because at a certain point in her life, someone came alongside her, a different voice, who began to speak words of hope and words of truth into her life. And more importantly, that person introduced her to the most important voice of all, and that is the voice of her Savior. And that changed everything. So I want you to hear the rest of Kristen's story. So watch this with me. I was constantly beating myself up over the decisions that I had made and constantly revisiting memories that caused me pain. So I met um, my coworker who actually I just recently learned she had been praying for me every single morning. We started to kind of build a rapport together, a professional rapport, because I was training her to do the same job that I did. So we spent a lot of time together, and she was really funny, and she was really good. And she was sweet and kind and soft-spoken but strong. I really admired all of those qualities about her. We started talking. I talked to her about... um, my past and decisions that I had made and she shared some of her stories too and that made me feel good to know that I wasn't the only one that struggled that she had struggles too and and she's good so I could be good too she had Christian music playing on the computer and I liked it and she actually gave me my first third day CD and said just listen to this you know and I put it on at work and it was like The stress went away. I felt calm. I can imagine like a window. And I had the window open and the screen was down. And it was like Jesus was right behind that screen. And as soon as I decided, like, God, I I surrender, the screen was lifted. God used music to reach my soul and, and transform my heart and my mind. Coming to Parker Hill and experiencing the live band, to me, it was like going to a concert. It was like, wow, I can really connect here through the music number one. And then Mark led the message the first time I was there. It was amazing. I mean, it was was so practical. I understood the message. I understood what I was supposed to take away from the message. It was unlike anything I've ever experienced at at a church before. You can be redeemed, and that redemption is real. And I want people to feel how I feel. I want people to have that sense of peace and security. I am a completely different person, and I am completely free from the pain It's amazing. It truly is.